Okay, um, so as Ian said, I'm Tom Stellard. Um, I work for uh, Advanced Micro Devices, uh, do open source driver development. Um, primarily, my focus is on uh, compilers uh, and also on OpenCL uh, and Clover, which is uh, what I'm going to talk about today. So uh, I'm going to just give a brief introduction to Clover. I'm um, also going to do sort of a mini OpenCL tutorial because I think maybe not everyone here is as familiar with OpenCL as they are with OpenGL. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what kind of programs and, and what kind of things Clover can do, um, our plans for the future, um, and then also talk about some other uh, related projects. Okay, so Clover stands for Computing Language Over Gallium. Um, so it started back uh, at the end of 2008, um, and for a while it, 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 there wasn't much interest in it. Um, I don't even know if the initial code that was pushed up uh, really did much. It was just sort of like a proof of concept, here's how it could work. Um, so then in uh, the summer of 2011, a Google Summer Code student uh, picked up the code and um, actually got it working and, and was able to, to run some programs. Um, but at that point, um, it had sort of diverted a little bit from the initial goal, which was to um, have a OpenCL implementation that used Gallium because of the the GSOC project uh, didn't use Gallium at all. It was just um, kind of a standalone thing. Um, so then uh, just a couple months later, uh, Francisco uh, picked up Clover again, uh, this time as a x.org endless vacation of code project, um, and did almost a complete rewrite, rewrite uh, integrated into Gallium, uh, made some additions to the Gallium API to, to make it possible to, to do OpenCL, um, and then it was eventually merged into um, Mesa uh, right around May of 2012. So um, just briefly, you know, if, if you aren't familiar with OpenCL, uh, it's an API that enables general purpose uh, computing on GPUs uh, and also other devices uh, like CPUs or even FPGAs. Um, so pretty much any, you know, any device, uh, you know, if, if you want to, you can, you can target it with OpenCL. Um, it, it's, it's good for certain kinds of parallel computations. Um, for example, hash cracking. Uh, so for if you have uh, a hash value and you want to figure out what the original input is, one technique is to do a brute force search over all the entire input space. Um, and this is something GPUs are really good at, so it's, it's, it's a good application for OpenCL. Um, other things, um, stuff like image pro processing, medical imaging, um, you can take advantage of a lot, a lot of the, the graphics hardware. Um, and also different kinds of simulations, um, a lot of physics simulations. Um, it can, depending on, on how they're structured, can, can really take advantage of the parallel computation power of a GPU. Uh, okay, so just a little more about OpenCL. Um, so a device is, you know, a GPU, a CPU, FPGA. Um, Though actually when we talk about FPGAs, probably one OpenCL device could be many FPGAs, you know, um, but typically one device is one GPU and one device is one, one CPU. Um, so the, kind of the basic unit of work is called a work item, which is, is similar to a thread um, in, in normal computing. Uh, and then we have work groups, which are groups of work items. Um, and then the memory space is, space is split up in this sort of four segments. Uh, there's private memory, which is uh, you know, only a single thread or, or work item uh, is able to access private, its own private memory. Uh, then there's local memory, which is shared between work items uh, in, in a work group. Uh, and then finally, there's, there's global memory and constant memory. Uh, those are accessible to all work items uh, in, in the entire um, dispatch. And, uh, and, and then constant memory um, is kind of a, a subset of global memory, which is read-only. Um, so for any OpenCL program, there's really two it's divided into two main parts. There's the runtime, uh, and then also there's the OpenCLC um, code, which is what's actually run on the GPU. Um, so the runtime uh, is, you know, it's regular C. It's it's a regular C program that uses C library, and you know, you do things like device creation, buffer management. That's how you dispatch the kernel. Um, you know, stuff like that. That that's that's sort of the runtime side, um, and then when it comes to OpenCLC and writing programs that you actually run on the device. Um, you use a special language, which is, is called OpenCLC. Uh, it's based on C99, uh, and it has um, some extensions, like for vector types. Uh, so OpenCL supports um, you know, all the normal types, but and also vector versions of those types. So 
VEC 2, VEC 3, VEC 4, VEC 8, and up to VEC 16. Um, and then OpenCLC also defines a built-in library uh, that, that just gives you access to uh, a whole bunch of routines um, that um, implementers can provide op optimization or optimized versions of, you know, for their specific hardware. Okay, so Clover doesn't do everything alone. Uh, makes use of a couple other projects to, to, to sort of round out the complete uh, implementation. Uh, the first thing that it uses is Clang, which provides an OpenCLC compiler front end. Uh, Clang generates LLVM IR. Um, and the way Clover uses Clang is through libclang, uh, which, which is a library that, um, you know, gives you access to, to different um, functions of the compiler. Um, it doesn't use the standalone compiler like some of the other OpenCL projects. So I, um, the alternative that some other projects do is, you know, they when they want to compile a kernel, they fork off a process, run Clang, write it to a temporary file, and then, you know, read it back when they want to use the code. Um, but the Clover skips all that and just, you know, uses the library. Um, the other project, which is closely related to Clang, is LLVM, uh, which is basically a modular compiler library. Uh, it provides a LLVM, a definition of an IR, which is LLVM IR, uh, and then it has um, several optimization and analysis passes that um, you can run in the LLVM IR, uh, and then it also has a framework for code generation. Um, so there's, there's a number of supported targets, um, in, including uh, some of the AMD GPUs, which we, we use with Clover. Um, and the final thing is libclc, which is uh, an implementation of the OpenCLC standard library. Uh, it's sort of like glibc for OpenCL. Um, so it's, it's written all in OpenCLC, uh, and it compiles down to LLVM bytecode library. Uh, and so that library is linked at runtime uh, with the kernels that you compile uh, using Clover and Clang. Okay, so here's just sort of a basic um, OpenCL program, uh, basic Hello World program. This is this is sort of the basic structure of most programs and, and how they look. And I'll just go through really quickly sort of what what each part of this does. Um, so the first thing you can do is um, get the platform ID. And what a platform is, it's a specific implementation. So um, with the OpenCL ICD extension, it's possible to have multiple implementations of OpenCL installed on your system at the same time. And you can actually select at runtime which implementation you want to use. Uh, so for example, if you have, um, let's say you have an Intel CPU and an AMD GPU, and you want to use the you can choose between using maybe the Intel CPU implementation, which is a completely separate. It has its own implementation of all the API calls, or you maybe you want to use the um, the AMD implementation, which has again has its own implementation of the API um, and, and, and works for AMD GPU. So you, you can switch. You can actually use multiple platforms in the same program. Um, so it's, it's pretty nice, and also it it, it sort of um, prevents the problem of having conflicting implementations. So you can have a lot side by side and you can test them, you know, in parallel if, if you want. So it's kind of handy. Um, so once you have the platform, you look for devices. Um, so Clover uses the Gallium pipe loader to discover devices. Um, and then it, it just creates a, a pipe screen object for, um, for each device. Um, okay, so the next two steps, um, you know, just create a context. Again, this calls into to Gallium's pipe screen, create context. Um, and, then, and then you typically initialize a command. Well, you have to initialize a, at least one command queue. Uh, and this is just to, the command queue is basically just manage events. So anytime you create a buffer and you want to write to it or you want to dispatch a kernel that goes into a queue and then, um, you know, it's executed in, in order or you can actually specify to have it be out of order and you can um, specify dependencies between events so the, the command queue will kind of take care of all that stuff for you. Um, so once you have all the, the sort of context stuff set up, you can create a program. Uh, so here I have sort of a basic program that just uh, writes the value of pi to an output buffer. Um, so to create a new program, um, you know, just, just use this API function. Uh, an OpenCL program is a collection of kernels um, and, you know, other maybe helper functions. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of, you can compile, you can actually compile multiple kernels into the same program and then you can pull out the ones you want to use when you actually want to execute it. Uh, so you can, you know, put everything in one file if you want. Um, 
So once you've created a program, you need to build it. Um, so this is where uh, Clover will invoke Clang, um, compiles the code to LVMIR, links it against libclc, uh, and then it also goes through and it figures out which functions are kernel functions and which functions are regular functions um, because the kernel functions are kind of special and th those are the ones that um, you can send out, those are the ones that um, can be executed by uh, GPU and they have a special calling convention because you got to set up the input parameters in memory. Um, and then again, once, once you have a program, you can you create a kernel uh, object that, that you want to submit to the GPU just with a simple call. Okay, so next thing you want to do in, in our simple program which just writes to a buffer, we need to create a buffer uh, to write to. Um, so we use, you know, this uh, API called CL create buffer. It calls in the to pipe screen resource create. Um, and, and this is something just like the, the context call, um, this is something that can be shared for the most part with graphics. So if you have a, an, a Gallium driver that implements OpenGL, it's probably imp implemented most of this function already and, and you know, it can be reused. So that, that's, that's one kind of nice thing. Uh, and so once you have your, the buffer, you you know, you assign it to the kernel as an argument, uh, and then OpenCL knows that the, if we go back to the um, program, you can see there's one input uh, to the program, which is an output buffer. So now OpenCL knows which buffer you want to use. Okay, so this is sort of the main, the main core of the program, uh, in queuing the kernel. Um, basically what this does is it, just, it takes a, a kernel that you've created and dispatches it to the GPU so the GPU can execute it. Um, so this goes through a whole bunch of, of Gallium calls, and, and these, are, these are all specific to GPU. Uh, so these are, these are things that um, aren't really used for graphics, th these calls. So, so these, are, this is, these are really the only functions that are specific to, um, to compute, uh, which, which is kind of nice. So it's you know, really not, not too much to implement. That, well, I mean, there's a lot of details, but it's just a small amount of functions. So just to get something basic working, you know, th there's really not, not too much you have to do. Um, so, um, so once you've dispatched the kernel, you have to wait for it to finish. So we, we have CL, call the CL finish. And again, this, this calls in several of the Gallium API functions. Um, and again, if, you know, with, with sharing drivers between graphics and compute, most of these functions are probably implemented already. So like, like when I was doing compute bring up, I didn't really have to worry about implementing any of these functions, which is really nice. Um, so once you're sure that the kernel is finished, um, then you need to enqueue a read command. So you want to read the data back from the GPU. Um, this just calls into transfer map, transfer unmap, and you know hopefully you get the right result. So I mean, th this is just sort of a pretty simple program, but a lot of programs are actually structured this way where it's, you know, create context, compile program, create kernel, dispatch it, read back whatever data you have. Um, so this is, this is a pretty, pretty typical setup. Okay, so with this in mind, what can Clover do? Um, so right now, uh, the hardware that's supported uh, are AMD Evergreen, which is AT HD 5000, all the way up through Southern Islands GPUs, which is uh, for the most part, HD 7000, give or take a few. Um, so the API, AMD drivers, really most of the API uh, runtime features work pretty well. Um, as far as the compiler goes, 32-bit uh, data types are, are really well supported. Um, there's been a little work um, from the community on uh, double operations for SI, uh, so that, you know, there's some, some of that works. Uh, and then also uh, constant global local memory spaces, uh, those are pretty well supported. So all data types, um, you know, even all the, the crazy vector types, that, that all works pretty well right now with, with AMD hardware. Um, as far as applications, um, so a, a couple months ago I sort of dove into the Bitcoin mining world and, and tried to get that working. Uh, so it was successful. Um, and so you can do Bitcoin mining with Clover and, and the open source drivers, which is kind of a big milestone. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty popular uh, OpenCL applica application. Uh, even though now I'm being told that the Bitcoin community is moving to custom ASICs, so maybe it's not, not quite as useful anymore. 
Um, but it, it's it's still pretty cool, um, and you know it, it's kind of a, a neat milestone uh, I think for the project. Um, other things, Piglet support. Um, so last summer there was a Google Summer of Code project to uh, add OpenCL framework to Piglet. So that's sort of ongoing, and, and um, you know a good majority of the Piglet tests actually work uh, with Clover, so that's good. Um, so one of the things I'm working on now is uh, OpenCV, which is the computer vision library. Um, so that provides all kinds of routines for doing computer vision stuff like face detection and things like that. Uh, so right now we get about a 50% pass rate of that test suite uh, with Clover. Um, another application is Gaggle, or well, GIMP using the, the Gaggle filters. Um, a lot of the filters work, um, not all of them, but so you can, you can fire up uh, GIMP and you know, run some GPU accelerated filters on your image, uh, so it's, it's pretty neat. Um, and possibly others. Uh, there's a lot of programs out there I don't know about, so I'm always, always kind of asking people, like, you know, if, if you have a program you want to use, test it, let me know how it works, because I, I don't really have time to test everything and, and especially figure out how all the programs work, so there, there could be lots of others that work, I just haven't really heard of, heard of them yet. Um, so as far as the current state of testing, uh, right now we have uh, around 1,300 Piglet tests. Um, and on AMD, we pass you know, about 1,200, so a pretty good percentage. Um, I think that percentage is a little high because most of the people who are writing tests are also fixing bugs uh, on the AMD hardware. So pretty much every new test that gets added is a pass. So it's not like there's, there's if there's people working on other drivers, maybe they would have be adding tests that would fail on, on ours, but since everyone's sort of focusing on this, um, you know, we get, get a high rate of, of passes. Uh, not really sure whether that's that's good or bad, but I, I would like, you know, it'd be great to have other um, driver developers, you know, working on it and, and contributing um, tests. Um, so there's, there's really three kinds of Piglet tests. Uh, we have the, the program tester tests, which are a lot like the shader runner tests uh, from, from the OpenGL side. Uh, basically, just you give it a file. It's got some code and um, some pr other parameters uh, in there, and it is basically tests kernel functionality uh, and nothing else. Um, and then there's program tests, which are tests you write in C, uh, and the framework will pretty much take care of everything, uh, creating the context, compiling the code, uh, and all you really have to do is create the inputs, um, and then you know write the buffers and then handle the outputs and check the outputs yourself. So th those are, those are kind of nice. They can kind of shortcut a lot of the, that boilerplate code um, that they usually need to, to do. Um, the other thing we have is custom tests. So basically that's just a regular CL program uh, and the framework has a, a library of helper functions and other things, um, you know, kind of like the on the OpenGL side. So you can, you can easily write tests um, sort of in, in fewer lines of code than you could with just the regular OpenCL API. Um, so some of the challenges that uh, we've run into with testing, uh, for one, it's, it's a little hard to find good test applications, uh, especially because it's, it's, it's sometimes hard to verify correctness uh, unless you, the program provides a test suite or you know what the program's doing. Um, so I, I, in my experience testing OpenGL, it's, you know, even if I don't really play a lot of games, I can at least look at a game and say, yeah, you know, that, that, looks, that looks right. I, it's, you know, there's no green patches or anything, so, so it works. But a lot of times with the OpenCL applications, they just spit out numbers and it's like, I don't really know if this is close or not. Um, and, and sort of it goes along with it. There's a lot of domain-specific knowledge you need. So you might have one test that's computing SHA hashes and you might have another test that's doing um, some um, um, image processing algorithms. So it's sort of hard if you don't understand the algorithm sometimes to debug and figure out what's wrong. And so it's, it's kind of hard to jump between um, different applications like that. So it makes it a little bit more challenging. Um, another thing is there's a really low margin for error. Um, you know, it, if people are running simulations for weeks and you get off by, you know, even a couple units in the last place, that pe people aren't going to be happy about that. So there's a really low margin for error. Um, so, so, you know, again, it, it makes it difficult in, in writing the tests um, and, and also in, you know, making sure that you can pass them. So I, uh, j here's just a little example of one of our CL program tester tests. Um, I thought this would be useful. 
Um, so I, I have a question about yeah. that. About that. So um, one of the things in the OpenCL spec is there's a bunch of definitions about how many ULPs every operation is supposed to have. Right. Do, the, do the piglet tests exercise that at all? So we don't do that yet. Okay. Um, like you can you can specify tolerance in terms of like a floating point number, but that's that's on my to do list is to okay. add um, ULP um, you know tolerance. Um, but yeah, that's that's something, and, and especially something I've been careful to to keep in mind when I'm implementing you know the CLC library. Right, I mean, especially in, yeah, in, in the libraries and in the presence of other backend code generation, it if, if you have tests for those specific cases, it makes can give you a lot more confidence that you're not gonna gonna break someone's weather simulation application. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's that's something good, and that's yeah something good and something I really want to do. Um, but I, I thought you know there's a couple talks yesterday about testing, um, so I thought. It might just be good for people to see what a CL test looks like because and I, I think a lot of people are familiar with the shader runner tests. So, um, so basically, you have your config section where you can specify the CL minimum maximum version that this uh, program can run for. Um, you can you can also um, add required extensions that are needed for for the program to run. So there's a lot of stuff you can do. You can specify how many threads with the dimensions and the global and local size. Um, and then for each test, you define the parameters, um, and then also a, a kernel function to execute them. So it's a pretty nice. Uh, the, the student did a good, really good job, and I, I really like this uh, this layout. So it's 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 been really useful for for testing. Okay, so um, just a little bit about the future work. Um, so right now, personally, I've been. Uh, working a lot with OpenCV, which, like I said, is the computer vision library. Uh, so I'm really hoping that I can get a a majority of the test suite passing on both Evergreen and Northern Islands, and also Southern Islands uh, for the next release. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. We're making pretty good progress. Um, the other thing uh, that uh, I worked on a little bit, and Francisco has been working on lately, is uh, implementing the OpenCL ICD. So I mentioned earlier, uh, the ICD allows you to um, Basically, select different implementations at runtime, and also makes it easier to install um, different implementations at the same time on your system. So, uh, I think that's pretty important for for Clover, especially as distros start to package um, it as an OpenCL implementation. It'll, it'll just make it easier for for the distros to package Clover, and if they want to package another one, there won't be conflicts, and you won't have to uninstall or choose between. Um, so, I think that'll be that'll be good. Um, the other thing I'm, I'm really interested in is the render nodes. Uh, you know, we heard heard a talk uh, about that yesterday. Um, it'd be really nice not to have to deal with the DRM authentication. Um, so I, I'm hoping we, I, we can get that hooked up uh, pretty soon. Um, another thing, uh, image support. So besides buffers, you can also create images um, in OpenCL. So that's something that um, I've been working on a little bit for our 600. Um, so ho hopefully that's something in the future that, that we can do. Um, and also, we always want to support more hardware. Um, so there's the uh, AMDC Islands, which is the latest generation. Um, I have basic support, but I, yeah, I, I want to get that out um, upstream. Um, also, more Nouveau support. I, I think right now the, the limiting factor is really just the compiler. Um, I, a lot of the other infrastructure is already there. Um, and it'd also be nice to have CPU support via LLVM pipe. Um, I actually think. Getting something simple working wouldn't be too hard um, because, as you saw, a lot of the the Gallium interface is shared between the graphics and, and compute. Uh, there's just a few extra functions uh, that, that need to be implemented. Uh, I think I think with CPUs, the, the tricky thing is uh, figuring out how to um, actually execute the threads. Um, you maybe use some kind of threaded library, um, and then also there, there's actually um, synchronization instructions. Uh, an open CLC, so you'd have to have some sort of mechanism for synchronizing between the threads. Um, so, it, but just getting something simple working might, might not be too bad. So it'd be that'd be kind of cool. Um, LLVM pipe is actually uh, already threaded, which is sort of its its big feature. Is that uh, after it's done all the command binning, you find out how many CPUs are on the system, create one p thread per. And go run the the commit the bins. So okay, 
um, that works for GL because in GL you're uh, you have a sort of nicely parallelizable scene with little stamps that you're you're drawing the the, the bits for. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not clear. You would probably need to do a little bit more work. Either you, I mean, I don't know how that how well that would translate to. Uh, it wouldn't translate at all to uh, to CL, I suppose, because that the the thread dispatch there is literally in the fragment shader. So yeah. unless your uh, your CL implementation turns into a fragment shader, then it, then that pops out then. Uh, it wouldn't quite work, but it's already got the pthread primitives built in. Okay, yeah, that, that's that's good to know. So I guess that sort of makes it a little easier. Um, okay, more future work. Um, so, like I said before, this, the limitation with, with Nouveau and actually other drivers that might want to um, make use of Clover uh, is really some way to get from LLVM to the GPU ISA. Um, so there's a there's been some work on a TGSI backend for LLVM, which would you know convert LLVM IR to TGSI, and you can feed that into the drivers. Um, and there's another alternative, which another uh, the, the, uh, another OpenCL project is doing, um, which is to basically just take the LLVM IR, write your own custom lowering pass, and lower to whatever uh, representation you want. Um, also, one thing we, we've talked about. Um, is adding a context usage flag uh, to Gallium. So basically you could uh, create a compute only context, uh, which would really help simplify s- the context setup and some of the state tracking that goes on. Because uh, right now there's not really a good way to, to dis- distinguish between a cu- compute and a graphics context. So something like this would be helpful. And, and actually we've, we've run into a lot of issues um, in our Cayman GPUs where the flushing of commands is a little different uh, between graphics and compute, and sometimes if you, if you do the same thing on compute for compute as you do for graphics, you get hangs. So stuff like that it would be kind of nice to be able to distinguish between the the two kinds of contexts. So that's just uh, probably an area for future exploration. Um, and then also, yes. Um, you mean like um, like with the OpenGL extension? Yeah. So I think the the idea with a flag is it would be like a bit a bit field. So you could say, okay, I want one, a context that can do graphics and compute, or I can do a context that only does compute, something like that. Um, so the other thing, uh, Piglet, of course, we always want more Piglet tests. Uh, always working on improving the framework. Um, so just one, one little example. Um, as I said before, there's lots of data types and, and lots of different, um, you can have VEC2, VEC3, VEC4. So when you're testing a built-in, there's a lot of repetitive code you have to write. You have to write one test for each um, value type. And so this, this explodes really fast because of all the vector types, of all the, the primitive types. So it, it, it's a lot of sort of redundant code. So one thing I wanted to do was make it possible to write one test and use this special gen type, which the r- shader runner would uh, pretty much just replace with, what, with the types that you've specified and execute the kernel each time for one of those types. So it kind of simplifies it um, and makes it so you can less, write a little less code, which, which I think would be good. Okay, so we're almost done here. Just going to wrap up with talk about some related projects. Um, so there's actually two other open source OpenCL implementations out there, which I, I think is kind of too bad. Um, but each sort of has their own purpose, uh, I guess. So um, the first one is is Pokal. Um, it basically targets only CPUs right now. Um, you can see the supported CPUs up there. And theoretically could support anything that LLVM could support. Um, also, there's uh, been talk recently about adding a libcuda backend to Pokal. So what you could do is, um, I guess libcuda is a way to um, tap into NVIDIA's CUDA implementation so you can pass it the NVIDIA IR. Um, so then you could use Pokal OpenCL and kind of use NVIDIA GPUs as a backend. Um, I was at a, a proof of concept Gallium backend, but I abandoned it because the Clover API is, is already pretty mature, so we don't really gain much by we don't really gain much by using Pokal. And 
there's so much driver work to be done. It's not. I didn't really think it was worth spending much time on. Um, and Pocal supports the ICD, which which is is nice. Um, so it, it's once Culvert supports the ICD, it's, it'd be easy to package those two together. Um, yeah. Um, well, I used them when I first did it. I used them as a guide. The, the que sorry, the question is, uh, how much ICD code can we borrow? Um, I used it as a guide, but really, the ICD is really a lot of just boilerplate stuff. So there's not really much you can reuse. Well, and then the other question would be, could so so the ICD stuff is just on support is just on the sort of the driver side or. Uh, I don't know that much about how the right. open seal ICD So basically works. what you have to do is um, the ICD uses C style inheritance. So what you have to do is for every seal object, you, you have to put the first member as ICD dispatch, and the dispatch has a table. So every time you call a function, if you're using the ICD, the ICD loader you know, implements the function and then just uses the dispatch table in the objects to, to do it. Um, I guess the one thing that was nice about Pocal having ICD is that initially the um, the dispatch table uh, for the ICD was only available to Kronos members. And uh, actually, even today, if you look at the code, you, you're not allowed to distribute it. So they were able to reverse engineer it. And so we were able just to use that. Because uh, it's, it's not really difficult to reverse engineer those kind of tables. Um, so I guess that was kind of nice. Um, other project is Beignet, um, targets Intel GPUs. Um, I started pretty recently. Uh, it seems to be pretty mature, so I think I'm not really up to date on the current standards, but just another open CL implementation that's out there. Um, and then uh, some opportunities we have for collaboration, hopefully between the projects. Uh, I think at least we can all use Piglet. Uh, it's a really good test suite. Um, so. I'm, I think the other projects are using it. Um, so hopefully we can get everyone uh, submitting patches back and, and make Piglet better. Um, I also think the, the C standard library uh, we could probably share. Uh, right now each project has their own implementation, um, which is a lot of duplicated work. Um, so I've been trying to port some of the Pocal stuff over to libclc, but ho hopefully in the future there will be more sharing. Um, and then. OpenCL runtime, probably less likely we can share, but it's, you know, maybe in the future it would be possible. So um, that's pretty much it. Um, so I, I feel overall, you know, we're making pretty good progress on Clover. Um, you know, there's not a lot of developers uh, working on it, uh, but we do have a lot of good testers and people are trying it out. So that's really helpful. So I'm, I'm pretty hopeful that in the future we, you know, we'll continue making good progress. So uh, are there any questions? Yes. Uh, so, which versions of OpenCL are supported by Clover at this point? Um, so, right now we're targeting 1.1. 1 .1. Um, the difference between the versions, it's it's kind of hard to tell. There's really not a lot of difference, and I'm not sure a lot of app, apps really at like 1.1 1 .1 has like a lot of really good features and I don't know of a lot of, I haven't come into a lot of apps that use 1.2 features. So at this point it's really more about the compiler and getting the compiler working than like most of the API because that, that's pretty simple. So it's, I, I guess I would say we're targeting 1.1 but there's not really, we don't like have an official list of here are the things that are required for, for 1.0 because the, it's a, a lot of it is the same I guess. and. So w would you say that the interfaces are mostly feature complete and it's mostly bug fixing and stuff now? Or is there N big chunks of functionality no. that are missing? Uh, they keep adding new features sort of as the hardware evolves. Um, but I guess I guess part of it is, is until we get like the compiler and sort of the core stuff working, it, the version doesn't really mean quite as much. Um, I don't know, because I guess if there's a feature of a higher version someone wants, probably we would just implement that. Um, it doesn't, I guess I don't know much about the, how the OpenGL versioning works, but it doesn't seem quite as strict in OpenCL. Um, but, I, you know, I'm not really an expert on that. Okay, thanks.
I just want to ask the same question. No, 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 another one. What's the version of LLVM you are using? The version of LLVM. Uh, so currently, it's you're using the upstream latest version of LLVM. Three dot three, yeah. 3 .3. Uh, and actually, probably it will work with three dot two still too, if you want to do that. But that's that's not really recommended. Okay. And, and how does that tie into Spear, their intermediate representation language? Oh, um, does that play into this at all here? No, I, I, we have I haven't really looked at to that much. Um, so yeah, I, nothing. I think the only, the only useful way to use it will be to replace TGSI with it in Gallium in the Gallium interface because we, the um, compiler is supposed to to emit the code in an intermediate representation that the drivers can understand to it's all that will using that will mean fixing all the drivers and But the drivers are not. Well, only uh, radium is. At some, at some level, something in, in Clover fits all the MIR. So if it fits all the Yeah. I guess. <laughs> Anyone else? Questions? Okay, well, thank you.